By this time tomorrow, the Senate should finally have their hands on an energy bill, an energy bill already gutted by the Democrats of any truly comprehensive effort to curb greenhouse emissions. Thanks to perpetual Republican opposition, even a scaled back attempt at some kind of cap on carbon is off the table. Instead, the bill will focus on just four main areas. Liability for oil spills, including raising the liability cap to $10 billion. Promoting natural glass, gas, including incentives of about $4 billion for trucks that run on natural gas. Energy efficiency, with $5 billion going towards incentives for retrofitting homes to be more energy efficient. And green jobs. That's it. That's the core of the energy bill. Okay, great. Now, there's good news and bad news here. Okay, well, there's really mostly bad news, um, which is that a coalition of denialist Republicans and cowardly Democrats have watered down vital legislation to the consistency of consomme. But there is some good news. We want to deliver the hope here, or at least there is the very least the possibility of action, even with the Senate locked in its current straitjacket of dysfunction. The president doesn't even need the Senate in order to do something truly far-reaching about our dependence on fossil fuels. As Christian Parenti reports in the current issue of The Nation magazine, all he actually needs is a pen. Christian Parenti is joining us now. Hey, Christian. Hello, Chris. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on. So uh, explain to me how this works. Uh, you, you call it the big green buy. What is it? Well, the gov government, state, federal, and local in the United States is about 38% of the U.S. economy. So. The issue in making a transition from fossil fuels to clean technology, at the heart of it is the question of the price of clean technology. Right now, it's a little too expensive. So there's a price gap between this new technology and old dirty technology. How does this price gap be eliminated? Maybe there's legislation, whatever, whatever. An easier way would be for the federal government to use the power of the purse to transform the way it is already purchasing energy, buildings, vehicles to buy clean technology. The federal government is the largest consumer of energy in the world, has the largest vehicle fleets in the world, it has a huge stock of buildings, and luckily Obama in October of last year signed an executive order that stipulated that government agencies should in fact begin to purchase green power and clean technology and come up with plans for doing this. There have been a lot of uh, previous executive orders of this sort, but this one included actual targets on reducing the carbon footprint of the federal government. So this would be a good thing in and of itself, but what it will do is it will create economies of scale for this new technology like electric vehicles, for example. Yeah, that, let's talk about that because in practical terms you tell this one story of this company that's making electric trucks and they talk about having to order parts, you know, 10 at a time. Mm -hmm. What would it mean for them if they got an order of, you know, 500 trucks from the government. It would mean that they could reduce costs between 30 and 40 percent on these different components. Because what they do is they put electric motors into onto chassis, and you know they have to buy wheels, chassis, uh, wire harnesses from the the automotive supply chain in general. And uh, buying in bulk reduces your costs. And one of the key things that has to come down in cost are batteries. So uh, the, the, there are a lot of ways in which the federal government could expand the use of electric vehicles. The post office is one of them. 150,000 vehicles, all of which travel basically in 20 mile loops every day, right. park in the same place every night, perfect for electrification. There's really no reason the post office should ever buy another gas postal vehicle except for the long haul trucks until batteries are up to speed on that. You know, what, what, one of the things that's so interesting in the article is you talk about the, this sort of gap in financing. You know, everyone wants to talk about innovation, but what ends up happening uh, is that we get innovation and then, and then what happens after that? That second stage, what, mm -hmm. what is the problem there in terms right. of financing? Developers of clean technology call it the valley of death. So there's a lot of capital, frequently it's government subsidies, to create a new technology. This is not just for clean technology, this is for cell phones and flat screen TVs, to develop, to invent the gadget. And then once some sort of gadget has been proven in the market and is profitable, there's usually lots of money in the capital markets to buy that company and, and keep selling the thing. But in between is the valley of death where there's a dearth of capital to get from victory in the lab to victory in the market. So the federal government could help cross that by becoming the main purchaser 
of clean technology. And we have to remember that this is how a lot of high tech has achieved mass market penetration is because the, the federal government not only paid for the early R&D, but also was frequently the first and second generation consumer. So another thing that could happen uh, would be for the federal government to create a green bank, which would primarily provide loan guarantees to essentially insurance for the frightened uh, private markets to come in and fund companies that are trying to bring new battery technology in case of vehicles or you know storage battery capacity for storing energy, smart grid technology, all that sort of stuff. Great. Um, everyone should check out that article, uh, The Big Green Buy in the Nation by Christian Parenti, who I'm proud to say is my colleague at The Nation magazine. Thank Thanks you a lot very for coming much. by.